All right, guys. Well, it's like two in the morning right now, and let me tell you, I do not want to do a video right now. I feel like this month I really got to earn it back. You know, I was kind of like fumbling there for a minute. I started out having a great day today. You know, I woke up, um, did a monologue for Patreon. Everything was cool, and then my mom called, and she was sobbing. That kind of phone call, pretty much. Rem yeah, I mean it. It reminded me of when Paul died. And I was like, what's wrong? You know, and it's just crying. And it kind of reminded me of the phone call I got when I found out he passed away. And so, you know, of course, my mind takes me to that place. I'm like, fuck. You know, if my dad dies, I'm probably going to start fucking dudes. Just to feel something. Why does it always have to go there? I don't know. God, be grow up man no my mom's like you know <clears throat> your dad's in the hospital now my dad's been having health issues lately you know that um patreon does at least i do monologues and like he had a stroke last month and like he's 76 years old so i'm at that age where you know it's inevitable that i will lose him at some point but i'm not ready to to lose him now so, he, you know, he's been having problems with his heart. He's always had um, heart arrhythmia. His heart was out of rhythm, you know, and it's been bothering him. And he was going to go get heart surgery again. He's already had it, you know. And my parents are the kind of parents that won't tell me the truth. Like, when I got out of prison in 2013, my dad's like, oh, by the way, I had a heart issue in 2011, and they told me I had an 80% chance of dying within like 48 hours or whatever. I forget what it was, but he had an 80% chance of dying. He didn't tell me. I'm like, why wouldn't you tell me that? He's like, I don't know. You know, you're already in prison, you know, running up debts with Southsiders. I'm not trying to contribute to your stress levels. So they, they're like, like, I'm 35. Yeah, I'm 35. They treat me like I'm a child, probably because I am. I'm very immature. But anyway, my mom, you know, my dad been complaining about his heart lately. And my mom was just, she was tripping, sobbing uncontrollably. And I was like, Mom, is he dead? And she's like, no. Like, she, like, stopped crying, like, sobered her. She's like, no, he's just in the emergency room because he was having a hard time breathing because his heart's been out of rhythm so they had to put him under anesthesia, and they had to shock his heart and get it back in rhythm. And then this month, he's going to get surgery. But it's just like, <clears throat> it really freaked me out because I didn't know. And then my dad called me later. He's like, hey, I don't want you to be freaked out. He's like, what are you doing? I was like, I don't know, figuring out how I'm going to spend my inheritance. And he started laughing because that's what kind of relationship we have. Um, it's kind of like the last time I talked to Paul, we were talking, I was like, don't die, poser. And I, I know that you're about to die. And we were like laughing about it. And I'll say this, like, I, I'm really hoping that I don't die prematurely, but statistically, it's pretty likely that that could happen. Now I have a son, I have another baby on the way. I'm going to do everything in my power for that not to happen. But if I did die, I'd want people, I would not want people to be all like, somber about it you know i mean i want people to be like man you think he's butt fucking in space or heaven or whatever you know i'd want people to make up or you know to i like paul i know for sure that was one of my best friends that guy's a brother to me i know for sure that he would want me to celebrate his life and not be sad about it you know he'd make fun of me for the amount of times i've cried over his death um, and my dad the same way, like, you know, he, I don't know, you know, when you have a close relationship with somebody like that, you know what I'm talking about. Like when Hunter S. Thompson killed himself, Ralph Steadman, the artist, was like, it's about time that bastard's been threatening that for years. And people thought that was like an insensitive comment, but it's like, you know, Pete, you have inside jokes with people. So my dad was in good spirits. I was joking with him and he's okay. But obviously the whole thing just like torpedoed me south. I was really sad all day. Um, <clears throat> thinking about what would happen if I lost my dad. Like I'm not, I'm not ready for that. And I definitely would like to 
really accomplish things, you know, uh, so that when he does pass away, I hope, hopefully it's a long, long time from now, uh, you know, he can know that I turned it around, which I've done, I, I, I have turned it around, um, substantially, but I'm not fully where I want to be yet, and it's definitely a motivator, you know, when he starts having health ailments like this, and, you know, both him and my mom, they have me late, but I really strive to, uh, work hard to, you know, so that, so that when that does happen, God forbid, hopefully it's a long ass time for now, like I said, um, you know, I can have some peace about it too, because I want him to be proud that I conquered adversity and went on to do big things and be happy and be a positively uh positive contributor to society so i heard some noise and i don't really want to smoke this but i don't know i could get caught fuck it nah, the door's open <laughs> but she still gets mad she's like ah! there's like a um there's like a towel on the door right now so she can't smell it i feel like i'm like i live with my mom hey ma <laughs> you know shit like that all right, so like, sorry, I'm all over the place. See, you see how my ADD mind works? It's like I get distracted, and then it's uh, it's really hard for me to get focused again. But um, you know, my dad, thank God, he's okay. I was so happy and relieved when he called me, and uh, and now I have a stomach ache. And I was like, fuck, I really don't want to do anything right now. But like I said, like I want to keep the momentum going, and I, I want to, I, I really want to earn it this month. Please like, comment, subscribe, check out patreon.com slash Ryan Leone, and let's get into the story. So this is going to be another Boston story. I know I keep going, all right, all right, this is the last one, and then I'm going to focus on the higher tier stuff for Patreon. I am going to do that today. I was planning on doing that, but the whole thing with my dad happened, and I was just, I was, I went south today for sure. I was not having a good day. Um, I was petrified that something was going to happen to him, but... So far, so good. He says he feels better. They, they put him under, gave him the shock. He's back at rhythm for the moment. So hopefully um, he can maintain that. So where we had left off last time, I was in Santa Barbara County Jail for the first time. And I was 18, probably about 126, 130 pounds, um, covered with acne, pubic hair, goatee, long hair and completely green, you know, didn't understand how jail worked. I thought that I didn't even, I don't even think I knew if there was a difference between jail and prison. Like, you know, I was like, Hey guys, are we in prison? And the South Star's like, Hey, that fucking white boy, he's stupid as fuck, fool. Hey, Let's try to get him to make his family, Western Union, my baby mama, some money. Hey, fool, Western Union, my baby mama, a hundred bucks. I'm like, okay. You know, it's all, like, green, and people are taking advantage of me. Uh, not sexually, though. But, you know, I was naive, and I was definitely scared to be there. I wasn't cut out to be in jail. Not at that point. See, the, the further that I went down the rabbit hole of drug addiction, the more that I was in institutions, the more I was around people like that, the more... I started to fit in, unfortunately, the more of a piece of shit I became. But back then, I was still, you know, I mean, I was 18. I was in a private Catholic school just a few years before that. You know, I I felt completely out of place there. <clears throat> so I ended up going on the recreation yard, and I'm, le I'm walking track, you know, the track by myself, and somebody shoots me a package he tells me to shoot it to baby puppet or you know papa scrappy from meals or whatever the fuck you know that always have these weird like cartoonish names and uh i end up going back to my tank so i was in east one i was in the gladiator tank the same place that i would get smashed out in 
years later by Bush Dwellers from Santa Maria. Pieces of shit. And I go to take a shower. Falls out of my sock. And I feel that there's something in it. Like there's like a lump in there. Like it feels like a pebble. I open it. It's a gram of crystal meth. And I don't even think twice. I'm like, drugs? I'm going to do these. <laughs> Consequences? Who cares? And I just snorted it. And I'm sure I masturbated, as we talked about in the last video. I'm sure I did. I mean, I'd masturbate even if I'm not high. But if I'm on crystal meth, you can bet your bottom dollar that I'm I'm masturbating. I don't even care if there's a curtain. I'll just, I'll just put a beanie over my face and beat off and pretend like nobody can see me. Sorry. That's what happens when I don't do monologues. I'm still kind of, you know, rusty. So I end up getting really twacked out. I know I've told this story before, but we're going to kind of, you know, get into further storyline. And I remember just going outside the shower. My eyes were huge. Of course, I'm paranoid now. I'm horny. You know, I'm like trying as hard as I can not to think about beating off because it looks weird if I'm just like you know look all zombified from the meth and then like, I'm like oh, I gotta take another shower and I just like you know because people probably could figure out what I'm doing in there I don't know what I was thinking doing an entire gram of crystal meth to my head like that wasn't even a drug that I did a lot at that point you know it, maybe like a few months after this I would get into crystal meth and like I, I was addicted to it for a couple years, but it was still relatively new to me. So I was really acting suspiciously twacked out. You know, I'd like go up to people and be like, Hey, do you want to kick my ass, man? You know, I, 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 t I got this like weird Manson vibe when I'm on meth. Like, Hey brother, uh, you guys don't want to jump me, do you? No. Nah? Oh, I, I don't know. I, some, some dude asked me, and I, you know, I'm going to go tell him that you don't. You don't, right? You're not going to sucker punch me when I turn my head? And, hey, what's up with this fool right here? Hey, I think he's on fucking, I think he's on that shit, fool. You know, and they knew that I had just done it because I didn't come in acting like I was acting like a straight up weirdo. Uh does anyone want to um, tell me any sex stories about the ghetto? You know, and of course, there's always some weird, like, wormy-looking South Side. It's like, hey, I'll tell you some stories about the ghetto, about fucking fool. I'll tell you right now. Come on. Let's go to the corner. I'm going to talk about it. <clears throat> I don't even care. And then, you know, I'm all twacked out, just stuck listening to this guy tell me stories about, you know, whatever. I mean, sex with girls that work at fast food restaurants or whatever he was telling me one weird thing about meth is that time you, you really lose a sense of time like you don't an hour what feels like an hour is like nine hours you know and i'm i was like you know i'd like read a book and then i'd be like uh, I should probably socialize, you know, and I'd go like back out and I'd be like, Hey, Hey, is, is anyone mad at me? What about you? And they just all kind of were like l looking at me and giggling, whatever. I mean, I was acting a fucking fool. And then I'd go back to my bed, like after I talked to them and I'd, I'd go read a book and then I'd get horny and then I'd like go take a shower. And it was just this constant, like, Ask outsiders if they wanted to beat me up, go read my Stephen King book, masturbate in the shower, finger bang my butt. Well, I can't even feel regular beating off anymore. I'm just going to finger myself. Oh, I'm so high. The problem with being twacked out in, in jail, well, I mean, <laughs> there's a lot of problems. There's the paranoia, there's the horniness there's just the idiosyncrasies that come with being on meth you just start acting like a weirdo there's just like i don't do well on meth if i'm not in jail but in jail it's just an extra weird situation
and there's nothing to do. You know, I'm like playing checkers by myself and like, I can't, you know, I'm pacing and I'm getting on the phone calling Kate and being like, hey, have you ever had sex with someone that's not white? She's like, huh? Are you on meth? You know. So, what ends up happening is I end up staying up, like, all night. You know, Santa Barbara County Jail, they don't turn the lights off. I mean, they'll dim them to some degree, but it's like, it's very hard to sleep, even if you're not on meth. But I just, be, you know, I'm like in my bunk, just staring at the ceiling. Just being like, oh. I wonder if I tell them to beat me up that they won't, maybe, because then they'll be confused. And I'm like thinking of stuff like that in my mind, just completely out of it, you know, just twacked out, horrible. Like, oh, I feel like drawing. I'm going to start doing like tic-tac-toe drawings. I was like, this drawing sucks. And I like shake a sal setter up. I'm like, hey, hey, baby Pedro, what do you think of this tic-tac-toe pattern I just did? Hey, theme hey, fool. Labra, you know. I don't really, you know, I can't remember exactly how it went down. But I do remember that I was reading the book Cujo at the time. I remember that for some reason. And what had happened is they had gotten a kite asking if the white boy had given them the package. You know, whatever they said, they, hey, I shot you a gram of meth. Did you get it? Obviously, they got a kite at some point, And they put two and two together. I'm the like the only white guy that's not disabled in there. It's like me and that other guy, Bernard or whatever the fuck his name was. And I'm acting like I'm on meth. In, fa in fact, I'm not just acting like I'm on meth. I'm acting like I'm on a gram of meth. I'm like looking at them, reading the kite. And I was like, what does it say? You know, no, I, I, I never saw them get the kite, but that's what had happened. They got word that they had sent something, that's, you know, they sent something over and they're wondering if I got it and they must have put two and two together. So I was on top, I was on the top of Sam Bunk that where that guy tried to like hang himself or I watched and just went back to sleep. And I was, I'm laying in bed and they just rip me off of it. They like take the mattress off. Like a group of them just approach me. I'm like, do you guys want to, you know, bam. And I like, I, all I remember is what it felt like to fall off that bunk. You know, it, it's this weird thing where like you feel your head thud against the ground and it feels like your, your head's like, um, hollow or something. You can, it just feels like it bounces like rubber off the ground. And then I'm just getting kicked in the face a bunch. I got jumped by like three or four of them. And I ended up waking up in the infirmary. You know, I, like I said, I've told this story before, but I remember like, get, I got beat up so badly. Like I remember like coming to, and my eyes were just like, you know, swollen shut, and I, like, I, I had no idea what happened, but I remember, like, squinting, and, like, seeing some infirmary, and I'm, like, looking around, and seeing all these people that are, like, missing limbs and shit, I was like, man, I'm still horny, fuck, you know, I, like, that's the first thing, I remember that, seriously, it's the first thing I thought about, I was like, where am I, I gotta beat off, oh, fuck, and at that point, getting beat up. I got my ass kicked. I mean, that was the first time that I'd gotten beat up in jail and I got beat up badly. I mean, uh, you know what? I'm not trying to like take sides, but I, I agree with them, you know? And like, I, I think I said before, last time I told that story for years after that, when I'd go to Santa Barbara County jail, Southside, like, Hey, you're that fool that took the crystal meth. You're fucking crazy. Hey, this white boy, hey, he's fucking crazy. This guy's fucking stupid, fool. You're stupid. I'm like, yeah. All right. You know, like, thinking I'm all cool. I'm like, yeah, I'm stupid from Santa Barbara. What's up, fool? So at that point, I call my dad. You know, I'm like, 
I can like barely walk. I like got to the phone and you know, I called my dad. I was like, dad, I got beat up by Mexicans. And my dad's just like, what'd you do? I was like, nothing. Well, and my dad's like one of those people that he's like very like logical. He's like, well, that doesn't sound correct. You probably did something stupid. Like my face is all black and blue. I was like, no, they just did it because I'm white. And my dad's like, well, you know the deal. If you can get Kate to leave, I'll bail you out. But she has to get on a plane to Boston. I want to drive her there myself personally and watch her get on the plane. I'm like, dad. All right, I'm going to talk to her. I really want to change, Dad. I want to get off drugs. It's like, all right, Ryan. Let me know what you want to do. So we end up getting off the phone, and I call her. Uh, and, like, in my mind, I was like, all right. I can't get back together with her if I'm in jail. Like, you know, the best course of action is to have her fly back to Massachusetts, even though I didn't want to. In my mind, I'm insecure, you know? I'm like, God, she did the Mile High Club with me. What's to say she won't do it with some random guy on the plane? You know, that's the kind of weird, insecure thoughts that I would have at that point in my life. So I called her, and I told her that I got beat up. And she's like, by minorities? I was like, yeah. She's like, that's fucking gross. You know, she's all like some stuck up chick from the East Coast. And I explained to her, I was like, look, honey, I love you. But I need to get bailed out of here. I'm going to get murdered. And I was like, they're not nice in here. She's like, what did you do? And I was like, nothing. And they just beat me up because I'm white. She's like, I knew it. They're animals. And I was like, yeah. She's like, okay, I'll go back. Will I ever see you again? I was like, yeah. Honey, have my dad take you to the airport, fly back to Massachusetts, and I promise that I'll get you out of uh, uh, that I'll get you back out here. She's like, okay, I love you. you know, it's probably that conversation. I'm doing a horrible job, like, um, you know, reenacting it. But it's probably more emotional than that. I'm just embarrassed because I was probably like, you know, I was probably crying and professing my love to her. I was really corny back then. It was, it's pretty sad. But that was the thing. So she got in contact with my dad. My dad ended up, um, you know, bailing me out. And I was in the infirmary at that point. Um, I don't really remember, you know, I've been to jail so many times, been to that jail specifically so many times. I don't remember exactly like getting out that time, but what I do remember is that my dad bailed me out. She got on a plane. She went back to Boston or Massachusetts. And I'd call her. And, like, every time I talked to her, she'd be like, oh, I miss you so bad. Oh, I can't live without you. You know, shit like that. And I'm like, babe, I got, I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to do something. I don't know. Maybe I'll get a job. I don't know. I'm going to do something, though. I'm going to get you back. So that was like my, you know, top priority was to try to figure out how to get her back to California. Now, after I got out of jail, I had to go to court. You know, I had to keep going to appearances. And my attorney, I remember going to court. It was probably a couple days after I got out. I'm beat up. Like, my entire face is black and blue. Um, I had a broken nose, you know. I've broken this nose multiple times. I don't know if you can see it, but it's like really crooked because I've gotten it beat up or I've gotten beat up so many times in my life. I don't know why. I'm a super good guy. That's weird. <laughs> I make totally solid choices. Um, but I remember seeing my attorney. He's like, Jesus, man. He's like, what happened to you? I was like, jail. I did drugs in jail. He's just looking at me like he... He always was one of those attorneys where he definitely judged me, you know? He, like, he thought I was a dirtbag. I could just tell. And he's like, well, look, listen, Mr. Leone, it's not looking good. Uh, I know that you've reached out to Kate. They've got uh, recorded phone calls and 
Damn it, I told you not to contact her. What are you thinking? Now you've broken a restraining order. And I was like, dude, she's my girlfriend. He's like, I don't give a damn. He's like yelling at me. Everybody at the court's like looking over. And, uh, you know, when I, they call me up to the podium or whatever to read me my charges. Now they're adding on new charges. So he got it dropped down to, um, you know, a misdemeanor. He had gotten the defrauding an innkeeper kind of like wrapped up or whatever. I don't know. Like, I guess at one of my court appearances from jail, you know, he had consolidated all of these charges into one thing. And then Massachusetts wasn't going to extradite me for the charges that I picked up out there. So I was able to bail out after Kate had gotten on a plane and gone back to Boston. But when I went to court, the judge was furious because I'd broken the restraining order. And he wanted to remand me into custody. And I, I remember, like, and I, you gotta, like, remember what I look like. Like, I'm complete. like, my, my nose is broken. My entire face is, like, looks like spoiled fruit. I do not look like I'm somebody that should be free. I look like I belong in jail. I look like I belong in some dungeon. I should be, like, chained to a wall. I look like a freak or something. And I'm like, what does remand mean? And he's like, well, they want to take you back to jail because you've broken your restraining order and they think that you're a danger to the community. And I just happened to tell my attorney, I was like, look, tell him that she's back in Boston. So he let the judge know that. He's like, look, uh, the victim's in Massachusetts now. Uh, Mr. Leone does, doesn't have access to her. He's not going to call her anymore. It's his first time, you know, ever being in custody. He didn't know that he could do that. It was a lot for him to handle. Whatever he's saying to him, he, like, talked the judge into not remanding me. Because they were going to remand me back into custody because I had broken that restraining order. And I, like, got off on a warning. They're like, if I if they find out that I contact her one more time, I'm going to jail. Um, he did get it reduced down to a misdemeanor. So it went from, like, a felony domestic violence to, like, a misdemeanor ba battery. Um, and, you know, they put the case on the calendar for like a couple weeks past that whatever i also remember being at that first that i think this was the second court appearance when the judge is reading like this laundry list of charges possession of cocaine possession of paraphernalia defrauding an innkeeper and like you know the entire courtroom's full of people and he's like also known as dine and dashing the whole courtroom just erupted in laughter I'm like looking at them. I look like a fucking alien. They're, you know, I look like the kind of guy that would do shit like that at IHOP. It was really embarrassing. But anyway, okay. So now I've basically been warned, like, I can't reach out to her anymore. If I do, I'm going back to jail. I know that. And I'm talking to her all the time on the phone. You know, I'm like calling from block numbers thinking that I'm like super slick and, you know, like using my parents' cell phone to call her, whatever the case. Every time I call her, she's crying. I miss you so much. I was like, babe, I got you. So now I started being in this like mode of like trying to do anything I could to, to make money. First thing I did was try to get a job, you know, and I applied for a couple places and I'd go and I look like, you know, I look like, some sort of like victim, you know, with like my face all I go to job interviews and, they, and they'd like ask me what happened. I'd be like, I got jumped in jail by Mexicans, but I learned my lesson. Be like, yeah, I don't know. I don't think you're a good fit. And so I wasn't able to get jobs because I was just an idiot and didn't realize that like, like I'm going around bragging. I'm like, yeah, I used to be addicted to shooting heroin. I used to smoke crack. <laughs> I got a pregnant girlfriend, so what, you know, and I didn't have like the social understanding to know that that's not the kind of thing you tell jobs. I swear, like, I thought that that was like, they'd be like, wow, this guy's interesting. It doesn't work like that with employers, but I didn't realize that at that point. So I couldn't get a job. That was the first thing. Secondly, I started asking my friends for money. You know, I wanted to fly her out here. I didn't know what I was going to do because we basically already burned our bridges. Like, you know, Lucy and her mom, because that dude, uh, Brandon said that I'd stolen the Coke from him. I couldn't stay there anymore. 
Uh, my other friends like didn't really want to have us there, especially because we're like in this ongoing, like tumultuous domestic violence kind of relationship. So it was going to be very complicated to get her to come out here. You know, we didn't have anywhere to go. But in my mind, I'm like, okay, if I can get her a ticket out here, then all of our our problems are going to be solved. So my parents, um, in high school, when that guy lived with me, the guy Poppies, I don't think you get on YouTube, I don't think you guys have heard that whole storyline. Uh, but my parents had pretty much adopted my best friend when I was in high school because his parents beat the shit out of him while we were on mushrooms. The the infamous four uh, door Mustang. He had a Mustang and remember one time I said that it was four door, two door Mustang because that's all you can have. And my parents basically adopted this guy. Once he lived with me, he's like a bona fide drug addict. To this day, he's like a hardcore he's like a homeless heroin addict right now um and and we don't we've had a falling out we don't talk anymore but back during that time in high school i would go raid my parents room like they'd be at work him and i were addicted to coke later we got addicted to smoking heroin while we were in high school and i'd go in their room and i'd look through their drawers you know and like my Mom would just have like wads of hundreds. I'd be like, fuck yeah. And you know, we'd, we'd get high for like a couple weeks and then we'd run out of money. Um, I justified it in my mind because I was thinking, I was like, yeah, my parents have so much money. <laughs> it's not going to affect them. It affects me worse not to keep my drug addiction going. They'd understand if they really could understand it. Now that I'm older, now that I have a child of my own, now that I've experienced a little more life, it's the principle. Like, I mean, you steal from somebody that loves you. And I only know now, all these years later, looking back, what a piece of shit thing that was to do. Because I justified in my own mind. Like I said, you know, uh, it's not going to affect them. So it's not a bad thing to do. But again, it's more just the principle of stealing from somebody that, that, that you love. Or that loves you. So... At a certain point, I started discovering that my parents had savings bonds in their room. You know, um, every year for birthdays, for Christmas, my mom has, you know, a uh, couple brothers and an aunt. My dad's an only child. Uh, his parents died when I was young. But my mom's parents were still alive and, and her siblings would all send me savings bonds, you know, $300 savings bonds, $600, 1000 You know, I just kept getting savings bonds my entire life, and that was going to go towards my college education. Um, at a certain point when I was in high school, when we were raiding their room looking for money, when we were, like, in the throes of cocaine addiction, I remember finding a savings bond for $600. And in theory, these things appreciate. So you buy bonds... You buy a $600 bond 20 years ago, it might be worth $630 20 years later, $650, whatever. It appreciates in value. That's the point of them. It's better than just face value money in theory. And I remember the first one I found was for like $600. And we cashed that. I didn't know that I'd be able to cash it, but we had a friend that worked at the bank, this guy Toby. And I was like, can you cash this? He's like, absolutely. Cash, he gave me $600. And then I started taking them all the time, you know, there were random ones, you know, they were sporadically, you know, uh, around their house. And for a long time, that's how we supported our habit. You know, eventually we started selling drugs when we were in high school, but there was a, a pretty long period where we were supporting our drug addictions through those savings bonds. My parents got hip to it and they started locking them all up and I couldn't, you know, I didn't have access to them anymore. And that's, I think the point that we actually started selling drugs when I was like 16, 17, I knew that they had this closet up in their room. It was a walk-in closet, and it had a lock on it. And I knew that there were valuables in there. Because, you know, by this point, I was 18. They knew that I, like, stole from them all the time. So they got this, like, special, like, vault-like door installed in their closet. And I knew... 
I knew. I was like, okay, that's the jackpot. You know, if they put that much money into making that thing that secure, there must be some really valuable stuff in it. So the first thing that I did, again, we've, I've told this story, but it's necessary for the chronology of this series. First thing I did was call locksmith, you know, and I remember I like put on like dress clothes and I was like, I'm going to pretend like I'm my dad. You know, I was still kind of beat up at the time. And like, I had like my dad's suit on. I looked ridiculous. I did not, it, it was obvious it didn't fit me. I had acne. I, I remember I like combed my hair to the side. I still had the pubic hair goatee. And the locksmith guy got there and I was like, hi, I'm Frank Leone. How are you? He's like, what's up, man? I'm Barry, or whatever his name was. He knew that I wasn't my dad, but I was like, well, uh, Barry, this is the thing. <sighs> I'm having a hell of a time getting into my locked closet. And he's like, okay, well, I can try to, you know, pick the lock for you. He goes up to my parents' room. He tries to pick that lock, and he's telling me that it's pretty much impossible. He's like, wow. He's like, this is impressive. He's like, this is, I, I can't pick this. There's no way for me to get inside of it. This tantalized me even more. Now I'm like, oh my, you know, what's it? There has to be like, you know, elephant tusks in there. Like, you know, gems. And who knows what was in there? crazy antiques that were worth money diamonds you know i thought like the goonies treasure was in there and this guy knew that i wasn't my dad but he really did make an effort to do it i think he just like i think he he found amusement in like the ingenuity of what i was doing try to think he's like god this kid's just trying to come up on his family he's like oh whatever i'm just gonna play along and i didn't have to pay him anything you know because he couldn't pick the lock i, I didn't get charged um, so he ends up, you know, leaving. I tried to kick the door down a couple times. Couldn't do it. I mean, this thing had like rebar in it. Like it was like it, you know, reinforced with metal, whatever it was. Um, and it just like, now it's my obsession. I'm talking to Kate all the time. I'm telling her that, you know, I'm for sure. I, Kate, I'm working on it, babe. I got this treasure map. I'm pretty sure I know what's at the end of it, at the end of the rainbow. Like, just saying these corny one-liners. I, I literally thought I was, like, in a movie, and she was, like, you know, the love interest. It was, like, 3,000 miles away, and I was going to come up on money somehow. I was going to do some heist and, like, get my love back to Santa Barbara. And we're going to live happily ever after. This is my delusional mind. You know, I'm, I'm doing coke again, or whatever, you know? So I have a few friends over at this point. The guy that I had talked about... Last time, the last video, I talked about a guy that I had stolen $600 from when I was in high school. Remember, I told him that I could get a pound of weed for 1200 give me half, 600 like these like guys with hoop earrings, like basically had me steal from him. Well, me and that guy had made up, and this is uh, Hugh Hefner's godson. I'm friends with him to this day, you know, um, he knew that. I, well, I don't know if he knew that I was, like, in on jacking him at that time. Actually, he didn't. You know, the whole time he just thought that they, that I had given these guys the money and that they had jacked me. He was over at my house. A couple of my other friends were over at my house one day. You know, my parents were at work. Even though we were all out of high school, a lot of my friends still lived with their parents. And my parents both worked full time. And they were pretty kick back too you know they're pretty lenient so my house was like always the kind of place where a bunch of people came and drank and smoked weed whatever so i had a few friends over including that guy what did we call him let's call him scott okay so this guy scott that i'd stolen the 600 he's there a couple other friends are there and i'm telling them about how i've been trying to get into this lock closet and I can't get in. I'm telling them about how I hired a locksmith and how I like wore like oversized dress clothes. They thought that was hilarious. And I don't know how I thought of it, but I just had this like eureka moment where I was like, wait a second. What if I crawl through the attic and make a hole in the ceiling and I can crawl in? And I'm like telling my friends that and they're like, you won't do it. We're all stoned. I was like, yeah, I will tell me I won't. They're like, you won't. I was like, 
So I got this little sledgehammer. It's probably like this big. My parents, they have a, they have a closet, um, another closet in their room. And you could climb up the shelves and you can go into the attic from that closet. So I get this mini sledgehammer and I climb up into the attic and I had a flashlight. And I go to where I think that, you know, that closet is. And I get the sledgehammer, I have the flashlight, you know, shining at the, at the drywall or whatever it is up there. And I just start hitting it with the sledgehammer, make a bunch of holes. I make this hole that's like this big. And I kind of like poke my head out, you know, and I'm looking down into this room. It's pitch dark. I'm kind of like leaning in and I just fall, boom, you know, probably five, six feet. And I remember like there's all this dust from the drywall that I'd broken and I'm like coughing on it. And I turn the light on and I look up and there's just this fat hole in the ceiling that I'd made. I was like, fuck. Um, you know, and, and I was able to open the door from inside. You know, you could unlock it from the other side of the door. So I unlock it and my friends run in there like, holy shit, I can't believe you did that. You know, I was like poking my head through like a hedgehog, like Mission Impossible style. And I kind of just accidentally fell and tumbled into this closet that I went and opened the door. My friends came running up. This closet's filled with a bunch of boxes, cardboard boxes. So I start looking through the cardboard boxes with my friends and they're all life magazines, which is black and white magazine from the 50s. My dad collects those. The entire closet's just filled with that. And then there's like a little safe. And I was like, what the fuck is this? And I thought that I, you know, because now my parents are definitely going to know that I had broken into the closet. There's no way they're not. You know, there's this big hole and now I've opened the door or whatever. Actually, um, I couldn't open the door. That's right. I couldn't open the door. I ended up kicking it from the from the inside and breaking it that was the only way to get it open because i couldn't get back up the hole that's right um you couldn't open it from the inside i kicked it so now the door's all bent and i was able to like open it it was easier to break it from the other side all right now i remember um so i'm thinking that i got burned you know that's a horrible way to look at it but i'm thinking that you know i'm shit out of luck there's no money in there there's another safe and there's all these magazines these old like black and white magazines that like aren't worth shit and then i see one box and it says ryan on it i go up to it and i open the box and it's filled to the brim with savings bonds i remember my heart just dropped i'm looking it's like five thousand dollars three thousand dollars stacks and stacks i'm like holy shit i thought it's like this is a half a million dollars you know i didn't know how much it was at the time and my friends are like looking at it and they're in disbelief i'm like dude this one's five thousand this one's a thousand five hundred three hundred dollars two hundred dollars a hundred dollars fifty dollars a hundred dollars two hundred dollars i remember my friends were like dude that's hundreds of thousands of dollars and they're just freaking the fuck out so we end up getting this box i'm like let's get out of here and the door to the closet's completely like, I broke it, it's all bent. My parents, when they get home, I'm screwed. They're gonna know for sure what happened. So my friend Scott, the guy that I'd burned in high school, he's with me. He ends up bringing me to like a, I think a Wells Fargo bank. Or, no, maybe a Bank of America. I don't remember, One, you know, like some big, some big, um, some big branch. And I, I walk into this bank with him with this box of savings bonds. And I wait in line and I just put it up on the counter. And I was like, hi, I'd like to open an account. I have savings bonds. And I remember the girl, the you know, the, the bank teller was like looking at it and her eyes were just huge. She's like, oh, well, that's going to take hours to count because they have to like figure out what the interest is on all of them. So I was like, all right. And it was probably like, two o'clock three o'clock in the afternoon at this point 
And so my friend Scott and I, a couple of our friends are like sitting in the parking lot. He just sits with me in the bank. They're counting it. A couple hours goes by and uh, they're like, sir, uh, we're done counting the money. It was like $82,000. She's like, yeah, so um, it comes out to $82,346.16. And I was just, I, you know, originally I thought it was more money than that. But still, just to hear that I had access to over eighty grand, I was just tripping out. I was like, I was in shock. The first thing that I did... You know, they set me up with like a debit card, temporary debit card, checkbook, all that stuff. They gave me an account. Welcome to the bank, Mr. Leone. I'm like, yeah. You know, and uh, the first thing that I did was withdraw $600 and I paid Scott. And I said, hey, man, um, I just want you to know that in high school, when you gave me the $600 for the half pound, I was in on that with them and I jacked you. He's like, huh? I was like, yeah. I'm sorry, but here, hope that makes it right. He was just so stoked that I did that, you know? I mean, I didn't have to do that. I could have gone my whole life without admitting to it. I'm definitely one of those people that makes mistakes, and then I'll feel bad about it, and I, like, try to make up for it with, by doing stuff like that. Um, and I wasn't even thinking about what I did to my poor parents, you know? In my mind, again, this is my money. This is my college savings, like... I should be entitled to my own money. Well, of course my parents aren't going to give me my savings bonds. I'm a fucking crackhead, you know? I was like the kind of guy at that point in my life where, like, if I didn't have a girlfriend, I'd probably, like, buy $80,000 worth of blow or something. So, I remember that day like it was yesterday. I mean, like, I'm, I'm literally in shock. And I called Kate, and I was like, honey... She's like, yeah. I was like, I'm flying you out here. She's like, what do you mean? I was like, don't even trip. I got you. So I got her, I ended up getting her a first class ticket out to Santa Barbara. And one of the very first things I did is I went to Macy's and I bought her an engagement ring. I think it was like six, six or 7,000. No, it was 9,000. I went and bought her a 9,000. That was like the first thing that I did. So I bought her a ring. I got her first class ticket to Santa Barbara. And then I went and got as a room at like a $500 a night hotel, the Biltmore. And then I called my Coke dealer and I asked him, um, you know, if we could talk in person. And so he ends up meeting up with us. I think that night I went and got like a, motel six or something um because she was coming the next day the next day where i was going to stay at that fancy hotel it was like five or six hundred dollars a night so i was at this motel six and i was like partying with my friends uh you know my parents were blowing me up i'm not i'm not returning their calls and i had this coke dealer's name was augie augie comes by and at that point i was buying like eight balls of coke off him all the time so i bought an eight ball that night you know, now I had all this money. It was like nothing. I was getting all my friends high. Um, and when he came over, I said, hey, man, you know, I need a kilo. He's like, huh? I was like, yeah, I need a bird. He's like, hey, fool, come here. Come here. Step outside with me, fool. We, like, walk outside. I remember we walked to the vending machines like, hey, lift up your shirt. Spin around for me. I seen if I was wearing a wire. So I did that. I'm all like skinny. I was like flexing my abs, pursing my lips. He's like, what? I'm not a cop. He's like, all right, fool. $20,000. I was like, yeah, I got that. You know, I showed him like a receipt for my debit card and it said that I had like, you know, 70 grand left or whatever after I bought the engagement ring and all the other stuff. So he had planned on delivering me a kilo the next day. I got a stripper lined up for that night and I ended up, you know, flying Kate into Santa Barbara airport. I hired a limo company and we picked her up, you know, and she got off the plane and she was just so excited to see me. She was screaming. She's like, ah! and she like ran up to me. We were hugging. 
and like I like lead her into this, you know, limo. She's like, where'd you get this money? Did you do something stupid? I was like, no, honey, I told you that I'd take care of you. I got you. So I end up taking her for some reason we went downtown Santa Barbara first I think we went out for dinner or something then we end up going to the Biltmore you know this really nice hotel that's right on the beach and right when we get there at this point Augie had already hooked me up with the kilo it was the first time I'd ever had a kilo you know it was a thousand grams of cocaine it had like a scorpion stamp on it you know like an imprint because that's how people sell kilos of cocaine they stamp it you know it's like a little indent with like a scorpion logo on it and he had delivered it you know earlier that day or whatever and i'd never it was a brick of coke it was crazy it had like tape around it, it was just like shit you'd see in movies and at that point i'd never seen you know jill's dad sold coke but i don't know if i'd ever i'd never had a kilo i'd, I'd seen one before but I never had one personally. So we went out for like this nice dinner. Um, and remember, she's pregnant at that point, you know, and in my mind, we're going to have a baby. We're going to live happily ever after. My parents are trying to get a hold of us or a hold of me. I'm, I'm just ignoring them. I'm not allowed to be around her because of the restraining order. And we end up going for a walk on the beach. And I remember rolling a joint in the hotel before we went. And then I had a stripper that was coming over that night. So I rolled the joint and I had the engagement ring in my pocket. And my whole plan was that we we're going to walk on the beach. I was going to go to light my joint and I was going to drop it. And when I went to go pick it up, I was going to get on my knee and propose. So we're walking on the beach and she's like, this is so surreal. I love you so much. I was like, I love you too, baby. I was like, here, I'm going to light this joint. I like went to light it and I felt it fell and I did the exact plan. Like I had said, I go to pick it up. I end up getting on my knee and I look up at her and I was like, I was like, I've never felt this way about anyone in my entire life. And she's just like, she's like this stupid look on her face the whole time. Sorry. If you're watching, it was, it broke my heart. What can I say? I'm still mad about it. She's like, will you marry me? And she's like, ah! she like gave me like a bear hug. I was like, ah! I was like, so that's a yes. She's like, of course I will. I love you so much. Poo poo daddy. Cause that's what she called me. Poo poo daddy. Because of the shit stains in my underwear. And she thought that was cute. She'd like tell her friend, she's like, it's so cute, he shits and he doesn't even know how to wipe his own ass. He's just adorable. I call him Poo Poo Daddy. I love you, Poo Poo Daddy. I'm like, I love you too, baby. She's like, what do you want to do tonight, Poo Poo Daddy? I was like, well, now that you're my fiance, I have, I have a girl coming over. She's like, oh, that sounds wild. And so we ended up walking back to the hotel, got this kilo of cocaine, got my pregnant girl, oh, my pregnant fiance. She's got this like $9,000 Macy's ring. The ring was like, it wasn't diamond. It was like jade stone. I think with like the main rock was like jade stone. And I think it had like little diamonds on it or something. The reason that I got jade is because our frog's name were Jade and Callie, you know, and that was like one of our little inside thing. We ended up getting back to the hotel and, uh, you know, I thought that everything like being 18, having like 70 grand in the bank, you know, well, actually less than I had like 50, but I had a kilo of coke and that was my plan, you know, and I told her that I was like, look, I'm going to sell coke. And she's like, okay. I was like, and I'm going to provide for us. We're going to have a baby. I love you so much, poo-poo daddy. I was like, I love you too, honey. And I just thought that everything was going to work out and we were going to live happily ever after. And boy, was I wrong about that. We will get into what happens with our insane 
cocaine lifestyle and everything that ensued. It just, you know, got really, really, really crazy. Uh, please like, comment, subscribe, check out patreon.com slash Ryan Leone. Hope you enjoyed this video. I was definitely not in the mood to do it. I'm glad that my dad's okay. And uh, I appreciate every single one of you guys. Palabra.